Hicks had been here before. He was sure of it. He was standing in a dark place, the air around him alive with fear and tension. They're all around us, someone yelled behind him, familiar like the rest of it. A warning horn screamed somewhere ahead of him in the hot, wet darkness. Huge coils of glistening black covered the walls all around him. No, he said softly. It couldn't be. He, they, were on Acheron, where the aliens had killed his unit, where he was going to die. He knew what had to be done. He'd done it before. Maintain your field of fire. We're gonna be fine. Eight of the squad were dead. As a corporal, he was ranking non-com. He had to stay in control. He heard shots in the alien den. The sound of a caseless carbon pounded his ears. A little girl clung to his arm, crying. Newt. Easy, honey, he said. As he picked her up, she turned her tear-streaked face up to look at him, while all around the creatures screamed and weapons screamed back at them. We're gonna be fine. We're gonna get back to the ship. Everything is gonna be okay. He was trying to run, but his legs couldn't move. Everything was happening too fast. He shouted more orders, unable to see who he called out to. Who was left? Shoot for targets. Triplets only. We don't have enough ammo to waste on full autosuppressive fire. There was a sealed door ahead. They would have to cut their way out, fast. The reactor was approaching meltdown and a swarm of the killing things was right behind. Newt screamed when he tried to put her down. God, she was so small. So helpless. I gotta open the door, he said. He pulled a plasma cutter from his belt, triggered it. The stacked carbon lock melted and ran like water as he waved the cutter back and forth. The door slid up. He knew what was coming. Knew that the Queen would be there, waiting to take him. He had dreamed it before. He stepped forward into a black, empty corridor and the sounds behind him fell away. It was dead quiet. Newt stood there. Not the little girl she had been only a minute before. She was grown. A woman. She walked toward him, her face calm and beautiful. Dwayne, she whispered and pressed up against him. Newt, he said. We have to get out of here. There's no time. The noise behind them suddenly washed back over him. Alarms and gunfire and screams. He jerked himself away from Newt and grabbed at his belt, opening his eyes. Quickly, a weapon, something. He was alone now, unarmed. He spun around in a circle, looking for Newt, looking for anybody. He heard the aliens getting closer, but he couldn't see anything. A computer chip voice informed him that meltdown would occur in five seconds. No, he cried out, fell to his knees. No, no, no. Three seconds. Two. One. Meltdown. The world turned to white. Hicks eased back into a semi-conscious state, drink still in hand, screen still flickering. Gateway Station was home to many archives, and Hicks had discovered files on the Sulaco's crew. Eyes only, of course. Sulaco, he muttered. Stupid goddamn name for a ship. Maybe that's why it fit. Apone, Hudson, Vasquez. In the world, they were nothing. But out there, they were my friends. I would have died for them. Should have died for them. You son of a bitch. You had to push it. Mark me. See how far I'd go. Well, it's over. You win. In the years since the Acheron mission, the nightmares persisted. No amount of alcohol or any other chemical substance Hicks consumed to excess since his return would cause them to cease. The only thing that kept him going was his hatred for the alien. The desire to see it wiped out for good. Attaining this desire was so close within his reach, as absurd as it sounded to him, and as much as he did not fully believe or understand, Ripley's plan would see to this end goal, using those very dreams as coordinates to some godforsaken planet that may be home to the one alien controlling them all. The operation to bring an end to the war was underway. It was a long shot, it was risky, but he had nothing left. He had given everything he could so far. It was worth giving one last shot. It was worth giving his life for, which he was convinced he may have to do before this was all over. Newt was still collecting data from the Dreamers, conducting interviews, collecting details and possibilities of these coordinates. 
data was syncing up, though not exact. A final visit was paid to the last dreamer on Newt's list, a Lieutenant Charlene Adcox, USCM. She visited the Marines' quarters, knocking on her door, while elsewhere, Falk and Tully were searching the station's storerooms in search of a particular set of items at Ripley's request. Lieutenant Adcox. Yes. My name is Newt. Could I speak to you for a moment? Concerning? It's about the dreams. How did you get my name? There are others having the same dream. Some of us rascaled the psychiatric files. Okay. How many others? We can't tell for sure. Upwards of fifty, at least. They're all the same. They're transmissions, not dreams. The aliens are telepathic, or empathic, whatever. It isn't coincidence. No, it doesn't sound like it. What do you want from me? You can tell me where you think she is. There are several possibilities described in these files. Only a few of us seem to be able to see locations in the dreams, and you're one of them. We want you to find her. To kill her? Yes. Her and her children. Falk was growing frustrated during his search with Tully. We're as crazy as Ripley, he muttered. Flying halfway to hell, and for what? Even if this thing exists, who says we'll be able to catch it? Here. Ripley convinced the base commander to hold them while she arranged for a ship. Storeroom's been under lock and key ever since. The idea of having them aboard gives the rank file the jitters. They're dead, Tully scoffed. Doesn't the crew understand that? Sure, I guess. Christ, I don't know. Sometimes I'm not sure I do. Fox steadied the beam of his flashlight on the objects of their search. A couple dozen specimens had been brought into Gateway in order to run biological and weapons tests before everything went to hell. Work began on their transport. Hicks traveled to the offices of one Captain McQuaid, a seasoned Marine, at times blunt but reliable for the right information. Hicks approached the Captain. I wanted to check something. Who'd I talk with to requisition a transport? McQuaid grinned. God, maybe. You're kidding, right? Hypothetically, let's say I wanted to go pick up a weapon that might wipe out the infestation on Earth. Could I get a ship? What kind of a weapon? A hypothetical one. Well, first of all, you'd have to have proof of this weapon, no hypothetical about it. Take that to General Peters, or maybe Davison, get an okay, a volunteer crew, and fill out the forms. I gotta tell you though, you'll have a fuck of a time, even with solid evidence. Why's that? In the last four months, there have been three attempts to get to and from Earth. Three official attempts, if you know what I mean. Hicks nodded. That meant other times that nobody wanted to talk about. The first ship came back with a dozen or so new civilians, but four marines outright dead or gone out of an eight-man crew. On the second, we lost almost all the crew and got zip rescues to show for it. And the third? Didn't come back. It's like the things knew the ships were coming and were laying for them. They're planning another mission soon. You know how the brass hates to have its butt kicked, although you didn't hear it from me. My point is, getting a ship to do something that could maybe help isn't high priority right now. Even scout ships are worth more than diamonds these days. And all Hicks wanted was a fully loaded starship to take God knew where across the galaxy to kidnap the mother of all aliens, hypothetically speaking. McQuaid's information hadn't exactly been a surprise, and if it were just him, he'd fuck going through the proper channels and just take a ship. He'd done that, and he knew how it worked. But he didn't exactly live in a void. Someone else was in charge, and if Ripley wanted to try and go by the book, he'd do what he could to help. But unless the General was dreaming of the alien Super Queen, proving anything was going to be a bitch. Newt had the data prepared. All the Dreamers, including Adcox, had fingered the same system. They had their planet. It was something, at least, but it was up to their superiors for the transport approval. Hicks watched General Peters scan the printout sheet of the psych files Leslie had pulled. To avoid problems with confidentiality and computer rascaling, she'd only included the names of the dreamers they had spoken to, along with statements from Newt and Ripley, twelve in all. Ten of them had agreed to go. And you say that the dream is the same in all of these cases, Corporal? The General spoke without looking up. Yes, sir. 
Hicks stood in his office at ease, hands behind his back. It was one of the more palatial rooms on Gateway, well lit and comfortably warm. Pastel paintings were hung on the walls, and the stuffed chairs were a high-quality synthetic leather. Peters had asked him not to sit. Well, this is very interesting, Peters said, looking up. But I'm afraid there's no way I can authorize such a trip on just this. We'll have to look into it further. His tone was dismissive. Hicks said, Is there somebody else I can speak to about this, sir? Excuse me. Hicks shrugged. He was still a Marine, sort of. They hadn't been able to pull all his records, so his status was pretty much in limbo until they did. That gave him a little leeway when talking to officers. He said, Well, sir, there are civilians in the governing board. They might be interested in this. Are you trying to be smart, Corporal? No, sir. Not with this clown. Say something smart and it would sail right past. Yes, there are civilians in power here. But when it comes to military missions using my hardware, I am God. Hicks said nothing, waiting. I've read your record, Corporal, and you've got a long history of being a troublemaker. I don't need any more trouble than I've got. Peters set the proposal aside and motioned toward the door. Hicks could see that there was no chance. If he thought kissing ass here would work, well, fuck, he'd done worse, but he knew it was a waste of time. Had known it all along but at least he'd held his temper in check. Thank you for your time, sir. The general grunted, but didn't look up from his desk, where he was already looking through other papers. The temptation to slam the door on the way out was one that Hicks was only barely able to resist. He reconvened with Ripley and Newt, having to deliver the bad news. How'd it go? Newt asked, cautiously. About like I expected. Head was jammed too far up his ass for him to begin to hear me fucking officers. Newt's heart felt heavy. It looks like the game is over, she said. Unless you want to steal a ship. Ripley grinned. I thought you'd never ask, she said. Hicks returned the grin. I knew it. I fucking knew it. You didn't really think some fat old general was going to give us a ship, did you? That was a long shot at best. Hicks nodded. Gonna make us criminals again. Well, sure, it would have been nice, but we don't always get what we want, do we? Time to go to Plan B, Ripley said. Which was really Plan A all along. We swipe what we need. Makes sense to me, Hicks said. Newt smiled and nodded. Well, it wasn't as if they'd never done it before. Christ, they were getting to be old hands at stealing ships. The one from Earth to Spears' military base, the one from there to here, the escape pod. It did make sense. What the hell? The trio were of the same mind on the matter. They wanted the alien dead. Newt, maybe most of all, thoughts came back to Amy on Earth. Walking back to her quarters for the evening, she caught the view of Earth, waiting for a moment, meditating on the mission to come and the obstacles ahead. She looked onto the faraway planet, observing Earth take in the warmth of the sun, the universe seemingly unaware of mankind's failure, still functioning as it should. Funny. We cling to our primitive cycle of day and night, the ritual of the sun. We bend the truth to accommodate our human weakness, whereas the alien merely adapts. Ever since I was a little girl, I've found that promises are little more than lies meant to be broken. But as we prepared for the mission, I made a promise to myself, and to a little girl I've never met. I'll be back, Amy. I swear it. Ripley had put together a crew from the space station's stranded military contingents, intriguing them with the opportunity to fight again. But there were still questions. Always questions. Hicks looked over the group they had assembled and nodded. Everyone here had field experience and had fought on Earth at the beginning of the infestation. The room grew quiet as Ripley walked to the front. Hicks and Newt had both agreed to let Ripley run the session. She was a natural leader, and it was her idea anyhow. Hicks was glad somebody else was in charge for a change. Made things easier on him. Well, she began, You all know why you're here. I'm Ellen Ripley. This is Hicks and Newt. Each of you has had certain useful experience, which is why you among the Dreamers have been chosen. You have felt the alien presence, the Queen, and it's time we did something about it. Ripley had everyone's full attention. Hicks hoped that they'd still be listening after they heard the bad news. 
Before we work on the specifics of our mission, we need to let you know some of the obstacles we're looking at here. Hicks? He cleared his throat. Yeah. I talked to General Peters yesterday, and he refused our request for transports. He paused. Actually, the man thinks we're bugfuck. Captain McQuaid broke in. Peters is an asshole, he said. The two Marines with him nodded. I'm surprised you bothered. The man's so full of shit he farts instead of burping. Several people laughed. Hicks grinned. Yeah, well, be that as it may, we don't have the official green light. We can try again, but I think the general is a waste of time. Ripley took over. Which is why we've decided to borrow a ship, she said. And that makes this an entirely different game. I want you all to understand what you're agreeing to before you make a final decision. If we get caught, we're in deep. If we fail, coming back here means consequences, maybe even if we succeed. She met the eyes of each person as she spoke. We didn't tell Peters where we were headed specifically, so we probably won't be chased if we get clear. But stealing a transport wasn't part of the plan when you agreed to go, and if you want to walk, now's the time. We'll understand. There was a pause. Fuck it, said Falk in a hoarse voice. Not doing anything would be worse. There were several murmured affirmations from the group. Hicks looked around and saw the same kind of determined look on everyone's face. No one moved. Ripley continued. I appreciate your faith, since that's all we've really got. Ten years ago, I made contact with an extraterrestrial intelligence. Told me of the world that first spawned the alien. The drones are only vessels guided by a superior external intelligence. Many of us have felt this alien presence. The tortured, empathetic bond it shares with its children. Its hunger to be whole again. The creatures were never meant to be apart. Together they create the nexus of alien life. One cannot endure without the other. But they were separated, spreading between worlds like seeds in the wind. And through it all, she's been calling to them. Calling them back. A call from Brewster, beginning to grow impatient. So, Mama misses her kids. Tough shit. What the hell are we going to do about it? Ripley went straight to the point. The bitch wants her babies. We can't bring them to her, so we'll bring her to Earth. In this. The shells are impervious to the alien's acid, but more importantly, they'll suggest home. Family. Her lost brood. Before the Earth was lost, a government scientist named Arona conceived a plan to detonate multiple nuclear warheads in the infested areas. Arona died before the bombs could be triggered. Why didn't somebody else do it? Another call from the crowd. Some malfunction, maybe. Maybe somebody got cold feet when it came time to push the button. Probably anybody who could say is dead. This thing, this Mother Queen, will draw her children to her. She'll try to replicate the world they left behind, and when they've joined in their grand union, we'll destroy them. We'll destroy them all. After a moment, Ripley went on. We want to leave here in a few days, and there's a lot to do to get ready. We're looking at ships now, and Tully, Ripley nodded at the hacker, is getting us a read on the security system we're dealing with. We've got a list of shit that needs to be thought out, supplies and weapons to begin with, and we need to work out details of taking the ship. As Ripley continued, Hicks watched the expressions of the people they would be working with. Several of them threw out suggestions as the discussion continued, and all of them looked as though they had been bestowed a special privilege in being included on this trip. This trip that could cost them their lives, and probably would. Yeah. They were a good crew. Not too bright, maybe, but he didn't have any room to talk. Newt checked the supply list for the third time, cross-reference with what was stocked on the Kurtz. The military freighter had been chosen for its large hold, designed to haul toxic liquid byproducts. The containment area could hold up to 10,000 cubic liters of radioactive sludge, was airtight, had interleaved durasteel and lead walls half a meter thick, with hatches to match. Anyway, the hold was more than big enough to carry an alien queen, and to keep her from wandering around the ship too. If they could catch her, if they could get her on board, if they could steal the ship in the first place. Newt rubbed her eyes and looked around her room. It was late, she knew she could get some sleep. In the morning, they would meet back in the dojo to run down the details of taking the ship. Security looked to be minimal, but there was some, and they didn't want to get caught. She had been put in charge of provisions, although the list Leslie had rascaled seemed pretty complete. The Kurtz was built to quarter 20 people comfortably, 
It carried an APC, and the food dispensers were stocked with pastes and concentrates that would be good for another ten years. Good being a relative term. They would taste like shit, but they would be edible. The ship was currently fueled and ready to go. All the comforts of home. More than she had here, actually. In spite of her exhaustion, Newt felt too wired to sleep. Her thoughts were a jumbled mess of memories and hopes. All that she had been through, and all the people she had known. As awful as the dreams that she had experienced at the hospital on Earth had been, they were even worse these days. Hicks. Mitch. Now Ripley. And, of course, Amy. It seemed to Newt that she had been running and fighting her whole life. She was in a place where she didn't have to do that anymore. She could probably live out her life here, on this station, and maybe die of old age. But that thought didn't play. There were people down on Earth being eaten alive, and that wasn't right. Especially since one of those at risk was Amy. So maybe she could go and do this thing and somehow survive. And maybe that would be the end of it. The Kurtz probably wouldn't be equipped to receive Earth's casts at the distance they would travel, so there would be no way to know if Amy and her family were still alive. The last transmission had only been a few days before, but there was no way to know if it had been on tape or live. Newt wanted to believe it was recent. She could feel that Amy was down there, perhaps praying for a way out. Ripley's plan would be the answer. Newt scanned back to top of the list, yawned. She knew that there was nothing missing, but she wanted to check once more. After all, there would be no second chance when they got on board. There was no turning back. Hell, it was already too late to turn back. Ripley sat on the floor of the dimly lit dojo, alone. It was early morning. The crew wouldn't arrive for another half hour, and there would be no time to think. She knew that they had planned out the mission as thoroughly as possible, that they were as ready as they would be. They could probably spend another day or two working out the details, but one could always wait. It was time to act. Too much planning raised too many doubts. You did what you could. She ran down the list of crew members mentally. They were a good group. The trial run had been successful. Of course, it would be different in real time, but the crew seemed committed and confident enough to get past any trouble. The only part that worried her was getting past the guard ships, but they were watching for incoming transport mostly, had been posted to ward off a possibly infected ship or one manned by somebody dangerous, like the Mad General Spears who brought Newton Hicks along as stowaways. It should work. Ripley hoped it would be as easy as it looked, but she knew from experience that things were rarely as easy as they looked. She had concentrated so completely on getting the thing together that there hadn't been time to relax. Not that there had ever been time for that once she'd run into the aliens. For her, it hadn't been that long. In real time, it had been the better part of a century. Now, the fucking things owned Earth, and humankind was a third-class local power. Her hatred for the creatures was as much a part of her as her hair color or height. It affected everything she did, was the force behind all she had gone through to get where she was. She smiled wryly. Where was she? Sitting in the dark preparing to lead a group of fighters to steal a ship, fly across the galaxy, capture the Queen of Queens, and eventually use their captive to lure and kill every one of the goddamn aliens. Ripley sighed. The choices she had made were simple ones, of basic morality, right and wrong. But now it had gone beyond just her. This could cost lives. Could mean the end of her own. She usually knew better than to try to take responsibility for people around her, but this felt different. Shit. It always felt different. It helped to know one thing. She didn't want to die. But if it meant taking that queen bitch out, or taking the bitch's spawn, she would. That choice had been made after the Nostromo, and it had become everything to her. The things had cost her too much. Her crew. Her family. Her whole life. She had nothing else left. She closed her eyes and waited for the others. They arrived early. The operation began as they met and set forth on their duties. Dunstan and Tully walked down the corridor toward the entry of Dock D6. When they turned the corner to the dock, they would be in a position to see any guard who might be present. Dunstan signaled to Ripley, Hicks, and Falk, who were following. No guards. Hicks was close enough to see Tully pull a small keyboard from her pack and plug it into a panel set in the wall. She crouched down and quickly began to punch in codes. The Kurtz was docked outside D6. To get to it, they needed to open three doors. This one, the entry to the airlock, and the ship itself. All were computer-coded, and the complexity of the entry systems usually meant no human guards, a major selling point for their choice of transport. 
They would get into the loading room and call in the rest of the crew. Captain McQuaid's voice print would be the key to the Kurtz. A licensed military pilot and the proper codes were all they needed to get on board. The codes Tully had rascaled up with little trouble. Maybe too little. While Tully set up a portable, Hicks moved to the nearest comm to raise Newton and the others. They were waiting in Brewster's quarters. The Marines had taken all the weaponry from the armory they could carry, signing them out with General Peter's personal access code. Truly a gift from God. Brewster nodded at the other Marines and they stood, picking up assorted wrapped bundles, weapons, ammo, various tools. No one spoke. Tully was already working on the airlock. Fock had stepped back into the corridor to help others bring in the equipment. Newt ran into the workroom. Fox shut the door behind her, and Carvey crouched to the floor with a welder. Tully tapped in the codes at the airlock. Come on, said Ripley, jaw tight. Okay, okay, said Tully, almost to herself. And got it. The airlock door slid open. Tully unplugged her portable and ran the few steps to the hatch of the Kurtz. She hooked the portable to the new hatch. McQuaid stepped in after her. The other stood tensed, ready to rush in. Behind them, the door mechanism to the D6 entry buzzed. It buzzed again, longer this time, the sound edged with high-pitched mechanical whine. It could have only been a second or two, but it seemed longer. Tully stopped typing and motioned for McQuaid to step forward. A quiet, computerized voice came from the monitor at face level. Command pilot, please enter vocal access code now. McQuaid, Eric D, Captain, A7050B, he said. Thank you. Tully input the final code, a grin spreading across her face. With a triumphant flourish, she pressed, enter. Ripley grinned. Almost there. Nothing happened. Invalid code. Access denied. Please enter new code now. I don't have any new codes, said Tully. This is it. They must have changed them since yesterday. The crew stood around her, tense. Can we blow the door? said Carvey. Not without alarms, said Falk. The big man looked angry. And that wouldn't do us much good to have a big fucking hole in our escape ship. Newt felt despair rise inside her. To be stopped by a fucking door. Hicks shoved past her and handed a box to Tully. Plug this in, he said. Quick. She grabbed at it and jammed the conductor into the opening of her portable. Ripley looked at Hicks. What? New access codes. Gotta be. The general is more paranoid than we thought. The hatch of the Kurtz popped open. McQuaid and Ripley strapped themselves in at the console while others moved around behind them, preparing for flight. Hicks stood next to the pilots. As McQuaid punched the disengage controls, a voice crackled out over the intercom. Uh, Kurtz pilot, identify yourself, please. This is Captain Eric McQuaid, and who is this? He spoke gruffly, impatiently. Sir, this is Lieutenant Dunn, sir, of the Kirkland. Please state purpose and authorization, sir. Operation Arrowhead, said McQuaid. He sounded bored. Access P21402. General Peters code. There was a pause. Sir, we have no mission scheduled from this sector. Dunn sounded very young and very nervous. Could you please wait while I raise the general, sir? Jesus Christ. Peter schedules another bug hunt without telling some dumb shit lieutenant, and now we have to wait until you drag him out of bed to okay it again? Think, son. Why would we want to go on this trip? For fun? McQuaid paused. Fine. Go ahead. But you better hope the general is in a good mood. Lieutenant. There was another pause, and Dunn spoke again, obviously taken aback. I'm sorry, sir. Um, go ahead. Access cleared and verified. Good luck, sir. Hicks and Ripley grinned at one another, and Hicks slapped McQuaid on the back. From behind them, Hicks could hear the others laughing. He walked back to strap himself in, feeling vaguely sorry for Lieutenant Dunn. By the time he got hold of the General for verification, they'd be way out of range, and there would be hell to pay for it. Too bad. Newt smiled at him when she sat down. Score one for the good guys, she said. He adjusted his seat before he answered. That was the easy part. She nodded and her smile faltered slightly. Hicks leaned his head against the back of his chair and let out a deep breath. They were in it all the way now. Gear was loaded and trajectory was set to the system coordinates confirmed by the Dreamers, and the crew of the stolen military vessel Kurtz were en route to discover if there would be any validity to Ripley's story. They'd know soon enough. 
Two days after the departure of the Kurtz, unusual readings came into Gateway Station. The word unusual perhaps losing its meaning in these times, but a private Donnell on his shift noted readings from Earth that he deemed quite unusual and reported his findings to his superiors. Dunn's report. I'm not sure what I've got here. At first I blamed the readings on faulty monitoring equipment, but look at this. We're not talking about some isolated event. It's global. This is crazy. These surface temperatures are far below climatic norms. And that's not all. Atmosphere composition, moisture patterns, wind fluctuations. They're mimicking the sorts of readings you'd see in the embryonic stages of a terraforming project. Crazy thing is, I've localized the energy source. It's plasma-based. And it's coming from space. In this series, I'm recounting the Earth War, as depicted in the Aliens comic series. The accounts are explored as originally published, despite certain names, locations, and other events having been altered over time. For more on the Earth War, you can check out the Accounts of the Earth War playlist on the end screen, and stay tuned for the latest videos. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a like, and you can also subscribe for all the latest videos from the channel. Very, very special thanks goes out to Will and Yutani Executives, Emurik, and Lady Anne part of the Patreon Hive. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.